An outtakes reel? Why would there ever need to be an outtakes reel? It's always, it's always perfect. I never make mistakes and then record over top of them. Are you crazy? Like I made a mistake just now. Oh, am I recording? So that wasn't done for the audience at home? Oh, okay. Um, so the first couple questions, uh, you're supposed to predict the entropy change is a gaining disorder or losing disorder. Uh, the, the two no's I think are pretty obvious. Um, when you are separating something, it's usually more organized afterwards. Or if you're freezing something, you're going from liquid state to solid state. So it's now going to be slightly more organized as there's stronger bonds between the particles. And then the other four that are yeses, yes, they're gaining disorder um, as they mix, melt, sublime, boil. Uh, I'm going to guess still that sublimation of A of choice A, B, and F, I would say that sublimation is the greatest increase in entropy. Would you say the same? Because you're going from solid all the way to gas, so that's a huge increase in entropy. So it's positive S, it's delta S would be very positive. What? These would also be positive, but just not as extreme. In the mixing, it depends on how much stuff you're mixing and how they mix it. I can't give you a magnitude on that value. Um, for B and C, we are using this equation that we went over in the notes, and I know my handwriting looks like it's ancient, um, so I'm going to decode that. We have delta S of the surroundings. That's what SIR stands for, surroundings. And then we have negative delta H of the system, that's SYS for system, divided by T for what? temperature. The temperature sh should be in Kelvins, BT dubs. Um, so this above us, we're burning propane and do you agree with that value sign? Is the combustion of propane endo or exothermic? You burn stuff, it's exothermic, it's releasing energy and therefore the surroundings would be taking in the energy, wouldn't they? And as the surroundings take in energy, they become more chaotic, have greater entropy. And so we have a negative sign here in front of the delta H, and that negative sign is right here. I'm just going to make it in blue so it's easier to see. Negative times negative is divided by the 298. So we have an entropy change for the surroundings that is positive 7.45 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Um, the per mole is left over from this and then the Kelvin is because you're dividing by a temperature in Kelvins. Entropy is typically in joules per Kelvin or kilojoules per Kelvin. They often leave the mole out even though it is a thing. It is per mole but they just are lazy and they leave the per mole out. Don't be surprised if you see units that say joules per Kelvin and you're and then quietly in your head go per mole. Um, Number letter B, if you will, or number B, if you don't know your letters. Uh, same thing, um, that reaction is evidently endothermic because there's no negative sign here. Therefore, the surroundings are losing energy and the surroundings are becoming, the delta S of the surroundings is negative. So it's actually becoming slightly more organized. Okay? Right. Click, click. Uh, for each of the following pairs, which substance has a greater value of S? That means, what do you think? Wh which one would have more disorder? And we're not talking about a change in disorder, but at its present state, which one do you think is more organized? Which one do you think is less organized? Or reverse that, which one do you think is has a greater entropy or meaning more disorganized? So why is graphite versus diamond? Do you know much about graphite and diamonds? Diamonds are extremely organized. They are a molecular solid with an intense repetitious pattern. Each carbon is bonded to four other carbons in a tetrahedral to a tetrahedral to a tetrahedral to a tetrahedral to a tetrahedral. And everything is connected. So when you look at a diamond, you're actually looking at a macromolecule, one giant molecule, which is why diamonds resist heat change so much. Because if you put pressure on a carbon, that then gets distributed in three directions. 
and then it comes down here and it gets distributed in three more directions and three and three and three and quickly all that energy is gone out through billions of carbon atoms and so the energy doesn't impact it much because it gets distributed so well with graphite though what happens when you put just a little bit of energy in a graphite does it stay together or break apart breaks apart because with graphite you actually have uh, circles of carbon one two three four five six that are then attached to other circles of carbon and then this one is another boom 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 but it's in a flat sheet and this flat sheet is layered on top of another flat sheet which is then layered on top of another flat sheet and the sheets don't interact much and when you write with your graphite pencil like you might do right Smurthy um, you're actually rubbing sheets of graphite off and you're leaving them behind like a little trail you're breaking very weak bonds between the sheets and the, the layers between have what's called uh, pi bonding which is really weak bonding between the layers um, and it's not nearly as well organized we had a question over there yes ma'am I, I did answer okay that's amazing um, cool can you convert graphite into diamond yes you can it takes a lot of energy a lot of pressure and it wastes a lot of money because the diamond is not as nice as the naturally occurring diamond are we okay with B and C though are those a little bit easier to answer yeah so graphite and diamond are so such unique allotropes of carbon Have you heard the term allotropes before what do you think allotropes means? Sounds like isotopes, but they got like weird. I'm just that ala in the front. It means they're such similar. They're made of the same element, but they're in different forms. And they're called allotropes because they're all carbon. They're all carbon. They're just in different arrangements. Um, and they're such common allotropes, they get discussed a lot. Does anyone know a third allotrope for carbon? Does anyone know what a Buckminster Fullerene is? Right. A Buckminster fullerene is a, a carbon nanotubes um, where it's just this long, thin carbon tube again and again and again. They use them to make, um, what's this motion I'm doing right now? Tennis rackets. They're made of graphite, or they're actually also sometimes made of Buckminster fullerene tubes, which are often called just uh, Bucky tubes. Or occasionally they'll take... Uh, little bucky balls which are like soccer balls look this is an amazing soccer ball picture I know it's not just pretend it's a soccer ball um, and every line on the soccer ball is actually a bond between carbons and they can have a C60 carbon 60 Buckminster fullerene is actually just a whole bunch of carbons connected together in the same shape as a car as a soccer ball um, those are highly, highly organized. I don't know where to put them compared to graphite, though, so I won't pretend I do. Right. So um, first, let's talk about, you know what? We'll do the red box so people don't cheat. Red box. People at home are pausing it very quickly. Oh, whoa. That was pretty. Not what I intended, but anyway. So let's, let's just focus on the prediction. Do you think that that would be an increase or a decrease in entropy based off of the reaction, okay? So the f uh, B, we're going from one gas to multiple gases. Do you think it's gaining disorder or losing disorder? It's gaining. We're going from two particles here to an earthquake. That's a lot of disorder. two particles to three particles that's probably an increase this one we're going from one solid to two solids three gases to three gases that's probably an increase also that's not a very good increase though is it we have one solid two solids it's not that huge of an increase that's probably an increase and here we have uh, three particles of gas Ooh, we made solid. What do you think? Decrease. Yeah, it's a decrease. It's probably a decrease. So we've done the prediction, and then over here behind the red box of annoying things, uh, I just did math. Ooh, no, no, no one wants to see that. No one ever wants to see Internet Explorer. Um, you only use Internet Explorer when no other platform will work, right? We're like, oh, man. 
I'm going to have to use Internet Explorer. So these numbers were not just magically obtained from my brain. It might feel like that because they just appeared. Where do you think I got these numbers from? The book. I looked them up. Yep. I googled thermodynamics values. Someone at the door? Maybe we don't want them in. Uh, let me pause it for a second. And, and that's why they call it YouTube. So, um, so these are just values, but I want to make it clear that this is the products products minus the reactants. It's what we're making minus what we formed, uh, minus what we just destroyed. So these are the product values. This is the, the three sulfurs the two waters as a gas minus the reactants and that is the entropy values so I had to look at the data table and find the entropy values the data table had entropy enthalpy and Gibbs free energy so I had to make sure I wrote down the right ones given my dyslexia it was a painful painful profit profess yes profess the painful profess Good thing I'm not recording. Um, same thing with the other two, just products minus reactants. Careful, careful, careful. Hey, Mr. Murphy, yes, where did that two come from? Can anyone answer that question? Where did that random two times two fifty eight fifty six? There's two molecules of SO3, so I did minus two molecules of SO3. Because we're not destroying one molecule of SO3. We're destroying two molecules of SO3. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, normally, it would be heats of formation. It's, that's what we did with enthalpy. These are entropy values. And so what we're actually calculating, these, calc these values are actually positional entropy values where some guy has figured out the positional entropy of each molecule at that temperature. They can't be zero unless you're at absolute zero zero of absolute zero temperature wise um, and we're nowhere near there we're like at 298 kelvins so they all have a decent quantity there cool did our predictions of sign match the math these two values say increase and the answers are both positive this value says decrease and the answer is negative huzzah all right, we feel good about our prediction. What? Yeah. Um, that's a good point. I don't know which one's right. So, I, I, one of these is supposed to be. I'm just going to pretend that's a two, but I don't really know which one it is, because the idea is still the same. Say that's supposed to be a two, so that's supposed to be a two, and we get an answer. I'm not sure which one I did right or wrong. Okay which is probably going to change this number, isn't it? Guess who just lost one point on his test? This guy. Louder? I don't know. I don't know. That's just my thing. Okay. Number five. The enthalpy of vaporization of ethanol is 38.6 kilojoules per mole at its boiling point. Determine the delta S of systems, surroundings, and universe when one mole of ethanol is vaporized. So, uh, first of all, the easiest part is this. This is the enthalpy, uh, uh, the entropy of the surroundings. The entropy of the surroundings is equal to negative the enthalpy of the reaction, also known as the system, divided by temperature, which we had just done. So I take the enthalpy and divide it by temperature and I know what the surroundings are doing by what the reaction is doing. If the surroundings are gaining energy, they're also gaining entropy. In this case, though, the surroundings are actually losing entropy, aren't they? That's negative 110. Uh, so let's go back to this equation here. This equation is a reference to which law of thermodynamics? 0, 1, 2, or 3? Dang it, you read the board. Good job. This is actually a reference to the second law of thermodynamics. 
The second law says that the entropy of the universe is always positive. It's always slowly increasing. Um, and I'm here to tell you, if, if you've reached this temperature and the ethanol is vaporizing, then it must be slightly greater than zero. It could be a lot greater than zero, or it could be just plus 0.1. But it's got to be above zero. So this is my entropy of the universe is greater than zero. Do I know the system? No, because I put an X in. Do I know the surroundings? Yeah, they got to be at least negative 110. Can I solve for the possible value for X? I can kind of solve for it in terms of greater than and less than. So X, the system, must be gaining at least 110. Why can't it be less than 110? Silence is deafening. Yeah, if this was if this is 109, what is 109 plus negative 110? Negative 1. Wah, wah. The universe can't have a negative value. It has to have a positive value for all spontaneous reactions. So the second law of thermodynamics is that the entropy of the universe is always positive or greater than zero. So X must be greater than 110 since this thing does spontaneously uh, convert over. Cool? All right. You drop that. Uh, worksheet B. Well, we went through A pretty quickly, didn't we? Should have done this on a Friday. Delta G. That's a fancy G. <laughs> Delta. What the heck? Man, I hate when I. These boards are slowly dying. Okay. This is our Gibbs free energy equation. And before we get into any of the math, delta G is going to tell us whether or not a reaction occurs spontaneously or not. The breaking point is whether G is positive or negative. When delta G is negative, then a reaction may occur spontaneously. Not spontaneously, spontaneously. And if it's positive, it is not spontaneous or non-spontaneous at that current system. Now, I don't know if I emphasize this or not, but Matt, all of these equations are, are calculated. All these values are calculated at one molar. One molar this, one molar that. Perfect temperature, perfect day, perfect, perfect, perfect. How often are we even close to perfect, though, in reality? Never. So there is a calculation that we had at the end of the notes that corrects for this. But this equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, is in perfection. So you might occasionally even see this adorable little degree sign appear. And that means, like, in a perfect scenario, here's the equation to use. And that's usually where we start out. So I took the numbers. 25, 5, and 300, and I carefully plugged them into the equation. Which number did I have to change and why? That was the most exciting silence. Let's pause it for a second as we look. You were right. It is the, the, the not the Smurthy value, <laughs> the entropy value. The entropy values were all in joules, while the enthalpies are in kilojoules. It is, it is my advice that you want to switch to the louder, the, the, the value that is larger, kilojoules. Otherwise, you end up with answers in the thousands and thousands and thousands. So I calculated them. Why are there two that are not spontaneous? Why are there two that, yes, are spontaneous? What is the difference between the yeses and the noes up there? Negative versus positive. 
And that's, that's going to be a regular question in your future on Friday when we take our test on Friday. Right? Yep, when we take this test on Friday. No, 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 we have no time for that. Friday. When we take the test on Friday, you can need to look at the delta G values and figure out if they're spontaneous or not. Number two, ethanethyl, which is a fun one to say. Ethanethyl. Um, is that smell in gas that makes it smell like rotten eggs? Um, and it says it's at the boiling point. So the boiling point means it's right at that equivalence point between boiling and, uh, so liquid and gas. So if it's at the equivalence point, delta G is zero. And that is something that's hard to pick out of that question. The delta G is equal to zero part. They've told us the temperature is 35 degrees Celsius. 35 degrees Celsius, is that really 300 Kelvin? No, that's a typo. Let me pause and redo the math there. So, so it looks like I had the right thing typed in. I just didn't have it correct on the board. So I, I use the delta G of zero since we're at the equivalence point between liquids and gases. That's the heat of vaporization, the temperature. I'm solving for the entropy value. It came out in kilojoules, so I converted it to joules because that's a much more common way of doing it. Number three, number three we have the temperature, enthalpy, entropy, and I calculated delta G. Will that be spontaneous if that's delta G? Yes. Should be spontaneous. It's barely negative. Now that was at 200. Let's kind of review, instead of talking about ammonia, which you're completely unfamiliar with, if I take a sample of water and try to freeze it, here's my sample of water, and I cool this water off, to negative 10 Celsius, will it freeze at negative 10 Celsius? I don't have to do anything crazy to it to get it to freeze at negative 10 Celsius. What's the, equiv the, the equilibrium point, the temperature at which it's in equilibrium? Zero, right? They can get below that and make it definitely freeze. And the delta G value would become more and more and more negative. The actual magnitude of delta G doesn't matter. It's not like something becomes more spontaneous, except for maybe around um, uh, Valentine's Day. Sometimes people become more spontaneous around Valentine's Day. But generally speaking, it's, an, it's, it's very slow to pick up on that side. Make a note, ladies. Um, yeah. It could happen at any po point. Yeah, once you're spontaneous, once you've, once you've reached a negative delta G value, the reaction could occur. But if you're positive, it definitely it can't occur. You're on the wrong side. Now, if it's on the positive side at one molar and this temperature and these conditions, you can change the molarity. You can do this and that. And so even though the standard delta G, and that's what this is right here, the delta G at the normal conditions, I usually forget to make all these little degree signs because they're tedious. The normal delta G value might say, no, it can't happen. But then if Peter changes the molarity to four molar instead of one molar, he might be causing enough of a change. We have a calculation for that later. Um, but the first thing he has to do is calculate whether or not it could at this value. Not really, no. I mean, some people are more spontaneous than others. But in chemical reactions, if it's a negative sign, it could occur. If it's negative 400 versus negative a million, it's still, a, that could happen, right, any second now. It could be happening right now. It could be just slowly happening. It's not about rate either. It's not about speed. Yes? I usually say not or, or prime. Sometimes it's read, read as delta G prime or delta G not. But it, either prime or not. But no one ever says degrees in that, in that scenario. I've never heard delta G degrees. Okay? Degrees are only for Celsius or angles. All right? Um, 
So down in this scenario here, the temperature was 200 Kelvin. You did the calculation, should it be spontaneous? Yes. That is not the equivalence point though. What would delta G be right at the equivalence point? Spontaneous in both directions. At, if it's spontaneous in both directions, delta G is zero. It could go forward or it could go backwards. And that's a big key also that we hit in the notes, but it's kind of like gets lost in the jumble of everything else that at the equivalence point, you know, when you've reached, when K is, represents the equilibrium value, delta G should be equal to zero. And could we solve for the temperature that represents where it's melting and freezing at the same time? Yeah, we can. We have the enthalpy, we have the entropy. We could solve for T, the temperature. And what's interesting, if you do that with ice, it's not exactly zero Celsius. It is a little bit above zero Celsius, but just so small that most thermometers can't measure it. It's like 0.01. But most people go, that's zero, because they can't really read it. Is that cool? Quick click. Um, number four, I decided not to write down every single value. I looked up the values and I did the products minus the reactants. Does that make sense? And so if there's a two, I multiplied the value for water by two, the water value for oxygen by two, and I just did the products minus reactants for all three components. Would you like me to zoom in on the three components? Yes, Ms. Kenise. No, sorry. Um, delta G and delta H are usually in kilojoules per mole because the values tend to be rather big, like in the thousands, so they switched over to the kilos. Um, s uh, s what is that? Entropy is usually joules per mole Kelvin. Pause. And now that we know his middle name, we'll never forget. <laughs> I'm now assuming that he's going to watch the rest when he gets home. <laughs> I Caesar what you did there. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's not uncommon, BT dubs, that uh, they leave the per mole off because they know it's per mole. But the kilojoules, the joules, the Kelvin, why is it per Kelvin? Ugh. Is entropy temperature dependent? You cool entropy down to zero, you can get the entropy close to zero. And so it is temperature dependent. Um, all right. And then and this, is, this is also, if you're doing products minus reactants, you're looking at delta G of the products minus delta G of the reactants. Delta H of the products minus delta H of the reactants. Delta S of the products minus delta S of the reactants. Or if you did the H and the S, could you also then say, now I could just do this. Could you just do this for the delta G afterwards? Because if you know the H and the S from the first two steps, shouldn't they add up? Let's try that. I'm very scared to try that with the first one. I'm going to do it anyway. Negative 802 minus, what's the temperature? Doesn't say, does it? Standard temperature of the room is 298 Kelvins. We're not talking about gas laws, talking about just standard room temperatures, 298. And then that is negative point zero zero six two all right um so what is 298 times point oh oh six and you have the negative and the negative which is going to make a positive that positive value and the negative 802 should give you something really close to negative 800.9 cool should be really close. They won't be exact. Why do you suppose they won't be exactly the same? 
one of the frustrating things about thermodynamics. Just like before, it's really difficult to control where the energy is going and to manage all of the energy go from point A to point X. When we did our calorimetry lab, there were huge percent errors involved in that. Um, and it's not uncommon for the values to be off by a couple percentage points, which ends up being real numbers. Uh, f number one, pretty straightforward here, just plug and chug. Uh, there's actually two questions in one. Calculate the delta G at this temperature. Calculate it if delta G was zero. Calculate the temperature was zero. So it's really just plug it in and solve. Cool? Number two, what type of problem is number two? Remember the name of that type of re equation where you're flipping things around? What? Hess's law. Yeah, it's a Hess's law problem. Um, let me circle the rest of them. I didn't circle them all. I focused on CH4, H2O, and CO2. Uh-oh. No, no, that's right. Okay. H2O is supposed to be a product. Here it's a product. CO2 is supposed to be a product. Here it's a product. CH4 is supposed to be a reactant. So I flipped that reaction around so it was. And then the oxygens. I need two oxygens. This oxygen plus that oxygen makes two oxygens. And the other pieces, this carbon and that carbon, end up canceling out. When you flip a reaction around, what happens to its uh, entropy, enthalpy, or Gibbs free energy value? flip the reaction around, negatives become positives and positives become negatives. And then afterwards, you're going to add them up. So I just added the three delta G values together to get delta G for the new reaction. Is methane a spontaneous combustion? That's what that says. Delta G plus two oxygens occurs spontaneously. Does it? If I just release methane into the air, is that going to spontaneously combust? No, it's not. Why doesn't it spontaneously combust in air? Do we have just oxygen in the air? No. We only have 20% oxygen. This is methane and oxygen and that's it. When they were creating this reaction and testing everything like pure methane, one mole of methane, two moles of oxygen and that's it. The perfect ratio of the two can spontaneously combust without a match, without a spark and go that way. Uh, I feel like questions three and four are in reverse order. Let's do four first and we'll come back and hit three. Number four is by far the hardest question in the entire chapter we've done so far. This is like in the acids and bases, a lot of it was very similar, kind of overlapped again and again and again. And then there were salts. Remember you got to salts and your brain was like, predict the pH of this salt. And you're like, I just shut up. Okay. And I hey, don't want to do that. Um, this is very similar to that idea. It's very complicated. Let's go down here and First, we're going to predict delta G at standard conditions. They gave us the enthalpy and the entropy, and the temperature was 28, uh, 25 degrees Celsius. So I calculated delta G. That's assuming we have standard molarities. Matt, what did I say the standard molarities were a minute ago? One. Is it possible that you do a reaction that is not one molar? Yeah, yeah, of course it's possible. We've worked at all sorts of crazy molarities. So there's an equation to calculate for the other molarities. And I'm going to check your equation sheet and make sure it's given to you so you don't have to memorize it. Plus sound effects at home.
Nope, it's not. That was an O. It was the O of sadness. Its, it's younger cousin is given, though. I'm going to get to that in a second. So this equation here, which I'm going to star in orange, is not actually given on the equation sheet. But here's when it's used. A person is trying to do uh, a reaction and figure out the equilibrium. So I put at K, at equilibrium. At equilibrium, what's the value for delta G? Zero. So if you plug in zero right here in place of delta G, and in this case we're saying it's at equilibrium. It's no longer one molar, one molar. It has shifted to get to this place. If this is equal to zero, the equation changes. Well, you wouldn't leave the zero in there, would you? It's no long, that's not a variable. So then the equation becomes this, which I'm putting a box around. This equation is given to you. Does that make you happier? Because this is like the next step after you make that assumption. If it's at equilibrium, this statement is true. Delta G equals negative RT ln of, what is K? The equilibrium constant. Yes, it's the equilibrium constant. This R, and Sydney, this one kind of goes to you with the whole units thing occasionally. I think it's you. You're Sydney, right? Yeah, it's you. Um, this R and this G have a fight, and G works. G wins. G is in kilojoules. That R is in joules. So I had to divide by a thousand so they'd be in the same type of units. All right? So I have to make sure my R is converted over to kilojoules, so I divided it by a thousand. Um, you might only almost mentally want to write it divided by a thousand in there under R so that it automatically gets converted. So I have delta G equals RT ln of K. How do you solve for K? This is an equilibrium constant. Take a look at your calculator. Maybe that'll help. What's the opposite of the natural log on your calculator? E, right. Not the letter choice E as in like A, B, C, D, E, but as exponentiate to the, right? So you have to like divide these two pieces over here and then raise everything to the e power. What is e natural log of k equal to? e to the natural log of k. k. And then the other side comes out, for this one, it comes out as 8.84. When you, when you divide negative 5.4, by those other two pieces, you get 8.84. I think I maybe left a negative sign out. I did. Uh-oh. I left a negative sign out right there. Sorry. So sorry. I see it here. I didn't write it there. And then there was a follow-up question that was like, what about at 100? What impacts the equilibrium position? Does molarity impact equilibrium? Just, you said temperature. You said it. Like you got right to the answer, didn't you? Temperature changes equilibrium. So you'll see that like at 100 degrees Celsius, the equilibrium value is different, right? And that's if you plug the uh, 378, 373 in for T, you get a different K. All of that same logic was going on in the question three also, but in reverse. If you plug in a value for K, can you calculate delta G? You can. So here's where I'm going to say this thing to you. Some of you are the type of people that are like, I need to get 100% of all of the questions right. In AP chemistry, that's really hard, isn't it? This is the one thing that the math gets so nasty on that a lot of people kind of go, I punt. I'm not doing that question. But let's talk about equilibrium and shifting. How do you change something to make it shift one way or the other? Let's say you have, I don't know, this reaction and you want it to shift that way. What do you want more of if you want it to shift that way? If you want to make sure it's going to shift to the product side, do you add reactants or do you add products? What? 
you add reactants. And so here, when we're looking at these numbers, I see they have more products. That's probably not a good scenario, is it? This one, they also have more products. That's not a good scenario. If you have more products, which way is it going to shift? To the reactant side. I went through and did all of the nasty math, and I came to the same conclusion. It's going to go left. Do you see that? So your best bet, if you don't want to go through all the nasty math, is to instead explain it from a Le Chatelier's perspective. To say, hey, here's the value right now. If this is bigger than the constant, it's going to shift that way. If it's less than the constant, it's going to shift this way. And you can still gobble up most of the points. I'm going to add a... Come on, pin. You can still gain a lot of the points by talking about shifting Le Chatelier's principle in comparing Q. Q is right now versus K, the equilibrium constant. Or you can go through the math and calculate delta G. Uh-oh. Yeah. He's been doing math, and I'm worried about him. All right, great. We have one last page. Again, uh, we're supposed to calculate uh, the delta G for a compound here. Um, interesting compound. It is no. No plus ozone destroys ozone. So we don't want to have any no in the atmosphere. No no in the atmosphere. Got it? No, no. Because uh, no, bless you, breaks it apart. This one would be really hard to predict the entropy change. I don't know the entropy value for this reaction. Take a look at it. What do you think it is, positive or negative? <laughs> it was an odd noise. Sorry about the giggling at home. Would you think that that entropy value is positive or negative? I have no guess. Why don't I have a guess? Two gases, two gases. It doesn't, there's nothing I can like latch onto. I have no idea. There's no way to predict it. You would have to just look up the values to figure it out. And you would do the products minus the reactants um, none of the values are zero. None of them are at absolute zero for uh, entropy. So you could go uh, delta G using the H's or the S, or you could go delta G using products minus reactants. I looked up the products minus reactants to get that value, and this is the, I left off my units. Anyone want to take a guess what the delta G units are for this equation? You think they're joules or kilojoules? Yeah, that was evil, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, delta G's and delta H are almost always in kilos because they end up being very large values, like thousands of joules. So they just get switched to kilos. S values, how much it's shifting, how organized it is, tend to be rather small, so they end up joules. And then because you're subtracting them, you change the S's into kilojoules just so you can do the math. I think the last page I'm going to show you has nothing on it. Yay. All righty. I think this is like the end of the sum, so we better go. Th